Yeah. Hello. Train a little bit okay. higher. Everyone, we're going to get Check. started. Matthew's <laughs> handheld. We're. Uh, I bet. Move it down. On, it's too high. Okay. Too high. Check. Keep, keep eating we'll and getting call. your food and everything, but we need to get underway with this oh. conversation. You know what? I should put mine on this um, side so that. Thank you. Uh, we are we are delighted to have uh, not a formal panel for lunch, but rather a, a conversation uh, between two people who are very knowledgeable about the the subject matter of this this conference. Reza Aslan was was born in Iran, now lives in Los Angeles. Perhaps his best known book is uh, called No God But God: The Origin, Evolution, and Future of Islam. And given that the issue, given the issues that we've already addressed and will continue to address today, it's great to have uh, Reza with us. Uh, also joining us is Varun Soni, who is the Dean of Religious Life here at USC. Uh, Varun got a law degree, and then to prove that there is life after law school, uh, got a got a PhD in religious studies. He has done a lot to, to raise the profile of religious life here at USC. He has many activities going on all the time, and he's a tremendous asset to the university. And so I'm just going to turn it over to the, to the two of you to chat. Thank you. Um, can people here hear me? Is there? Yeah? Testing. You got it? Yeah, Is there anyone we can turn good. up the mics? Volume? You're good in the back? Good. Okay, right. great. Great. All right, before we begin, I'm going to do a shameless um, promotion. Uh, you may know that we're hosting His Holiness the Dalai Lama at USC on May 3rd. It's his first uh, visit to USC. For those of us interested in faith diplomacy, there's probably not a person in the world who represents that trend better than His Holiness. So I encourage you all to get tickets if you haven't already. May 3rd at the Galen Center, tickets are still available 9.30 to 11, and he'll be talking about secular ethics. So I'm really happy to be here with you and with my old friend Reza. We've known each other for 14 years. We're getting, getting old, getting gray. Um, and the way we're going to do this is um, I'll talk to him for about uh, 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll turn it over for about 20 minutes of questions and answers, and it'll be a fairly informal affair. So, or maybe 30, 30. Maybe 30, 30. <laughs> we'll, we'll play it by ear. So thank you, Reza, for being here. I know how busy you are. And Thank you, Varun. Thank you all. This has been a, a fascinating morning so far. I really enjoyed the two, the two panels and the discussions that are being had. And, and you know, as uh, a proud uh, longtime member of the uh, Center for Public Diplomacy, this is, this is a, a real treat for me to, to be able to be here uh, with all of you and, and with my good friend Varun. And it's true, we have known each other. Have you noticed that the, the older we get, the less we start to look like each other? Have you noticed that? Which is good, because really when we're in graduate school, no one can tell us no apart. Yet. Sure. Not even our girlfriends. <laughs> it's another story. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I like, you know, going on our sort of personal connection, I want to start off with a personal question. You know, when both of us were in graduate school, I think we were really inspired by uh, Houston Smith and Joseph Campbell. And I think we had similar aspirations. We wanted to be able to talk about religion in the public sphere, broadly conceived. But in your life, I think your career has kind of taken a different trajectory. You're a writer, a professor, an entrepreneur. But you're also a new type of diplomat. You represent uh, Islam to uh, people in the United States. And increasingly, you represent Muslim Americans to people around the world because you travel so frequently. So what does faith diplomacy mean mm -hmm. to you personally? And do you view yourself as a type of faith diplomat? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, part of it has to do with this larger issue about the way that diplomacy is changing. Uh, in a globalized world, and, and in what many people are saying, you know, will, will soon become a post-nationalist world. And, and if that, if that uh, reality does come to pass, then um, what we now call public diplomacy will be known very soon as just diplomacy. Um, and so this idea that the relations uh, in the future, th th that the, the primary field of relations isn't going to be nation to nation, but people to people, um, then uh, you know this is precisely what we are doing now. It's this idea of of individual ambassadors, if you will, people uh, who, like myself, who transcend uh, multiple cultures, multiple uh, religions, multiple nationalities, multiple ethnicities, and so in some ways um, can be put into a position in which uh, you are not just a bridge between peoples and cultures, but really play the role of, of translator of these peoples and, and, and these cultures. And that certainly um, has become much more 
uh, prevalent with those of us who, who work in the field of Islam or, or, or Middle Eastern studies. Um, where, I mean, Najiba and I were just joking about the fact that, you know, we used to just be scholars and now somehow we've become the spokespersons for like 1.5 billion people. <laughs> nobody, nobody asked me to do this job and, and I certainly didn't, don't want it. It just kind of, you know, that, that's how, uh, you know, things, things worked out. But it, it is something that I think, you know, we take seriously and one, one that I think is, it really may become sort of the model uh, for the way diplomacy works uh, in the future uh, in, in more general terms. On another note, this, this thing that I think uh, I want to emphasize some ways goes back to something that John said in the, in the morning panel, which I, which, I, which I thought was absolutely correct, which is that you know, we have to stop thinking about religion as being a matter of faith. Uh, religion, and this is true of all religions in all parts of the world, is always a, more a matter of identity than it is a matter of belief. And so uh, having someone like myself who is an, is an expert on religions doing uh, public diplomacy work or even international relations work or even work with regard to sort of the uh, uh, politics and, and social issues uh, for some people seems like a, a bit of a disconnect. But in fact, it's not. Because as we all know, religion uh, is uh, very much infuses those other other issues, those other things. So, uh, faith diplomacy is just diplomacy. You know, uh, religious diplomacy is just diplomacy. They're, they they are all very much. I don't I don't think we should think of it as a, as a separate category by any means. In your first book, No God But God, a New York Times bestseller, it's available for purchase outside. You make a provocative argument that we are living in the middle of the Islamic Reformation and that the perceived conflict between the West and the Muslim world is actually a conversation that's happening within the Muslim world itself. So given the extraordinary events that we've seen recently in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, um, do you see this political change in North Africa and the Middle East that's happening now as part of the Islamic Reformation? And if so, how? Well, first of all, we're in a room full of academics, so let's define terms. Uh, Reformation, which obviously is a, is a term with a lot of cultural baggage uh, to it, 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 you know, has these specific connotations with Europe and, and with Christianity in general, is, is seen as a, as a problematic term uh, by some Muslims who believe that, well, Reformation means that there's something wrong and that you're reforming it, uh, and by non-Muslims uh, who then immediately begin to ascribe um, you know certain expectations on it, but reformation from the the perspective of religious studies is a universal phenomenon. It means nothing more than the ever-present conflict between institutions and individuals over who has the authority to define a faith, uh, which after all is is the is the central conflict of all great religious traditions. Now, in times of societal stress, times of social upheaval or, or social ruptures, uh, that ever-present conflict can erupt onto the surface and sometimes with catastrophic results, uh, whether you're talking about first century Palestine uh, or whether you're talking about 16th century Germany um, or whether you're talking about you know, this process that has been going on over the last hundred years within Islam. Uh, in which that same conflict between institutions and individuals um, has really fractured uh, both in a geopolitical sense but also uh, you know within within a, a, a theological sense fractured the the sources of authority upon which Islam rests uh, now this has been uh, a process that's accelerated over the last a uh, few decades for a number of reasons. Certainly, uh, greater access to information and sources of knowledge, um, greater levels of literacy and, and education. Um, these things have played a huge role. Um, the, the, uh, the prevalence of new social media technologies, the internet, satellite, television. In fact, I always sort of emphasize how the internet is playing the same role in the Islamic Reformation that the printing press played in the Christian Reformation in that you know, I information now is available in, in ways that would have been unimaginable. All of this has democratized religious authority in Islam. It has taken away the monopoly of the ulema as the sole interpreters of, of uh, Islamic, um, of the meaning and message of, of Islam. And 
that rapid sense of individualism, that's a kind of militant anti-institutionalism, uh, which has given birth to these wonderful new ideals uh, of Islamic, um, you know, modernism, Islamic democracy, Islamic pluralism, has also given birth to Islamic violence, Islamic uh, terror. Someone mentioned Amr Khaled uh, a little while ago. The thing that's important to understand about Amr Khaled is that yes, he has an audience of hundreds of millions of Muslims from Indonesia to Detroit, uh, and that he in many ways uh, has utterly usurped the authority of the ulema um, in becoming the primary source of authority, the primary source of interpretation for, for these young Muslims, the important thing to understand is that he has absolutely no qualifications whatsoever to do what he does. He's never studied a day in his life in any Islamic seminary. Uh, he has no clerical qualifications. He is not authorized according to the traditional strictures of authority in Islam to be doing what he's doing. Uh, and yet that is precisely why he's popular. The, he, he gets his authority specifically from the fact that he is not an imam, that he is not a mufti, that he is not a member of the ulema. That's why people are drawn to him. And in fact, he gets his entire sort of identity in direct opposition to those institutions. What does this have to do with what we're seeing around the region? Well, it's, what we're seeing is precisely that sense of radical individualism uh, rising to the surface uh, and, and really uh, confronting the social and political aspirations that these people have. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit more about you know, what are the, the religious dimensions and the social and economic dimensions in the so-called Arab awakening that we're witnessing um, over the last few months across North Africa and parts of the Middle East. But I think that the important thing to understand uh, is that the one thing that all of these various countries have in common with each other is the fact that the institutions, whether it's Al-Azhar or the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, have become nearly irrelevant. Uh, to the, 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 the process of revolution. Now, when we start talking about statecraft and state building, these, these institutions are going to flex their muscles again, and we're seeing that already. But the, the, these kids who have thoroughly ab ab absorbed this concept of radical individualism in what was once the quintessentially communal religion, uh, are at the forefront of not just the political changes that are rocking the, the Middle East, but of the religious changes that are changing Islam uh, for both good and bad in, in the 21st century. You know, for years, people living in the Arab world have been told that they have two choices for political governance. Either there's a secular dictatorship mm -hmm. or a fundamentalist theocracy. But of course, what's happened in North Africa and the Middle East has forged a new path. What does the what what does what, what happened in Egypt and Tunisia? What impact will that have on Saudi Arabia? And what does this mean for Iran's green movement? Yeah, this is a very good question, and you're right about that that sort of simple polarization. That the United Nations has a term for that. They call it the legitimacy of blackmail, uh, and the way that we have been blackmailed for the last you know 50, 60 years into supporting these dictatorial regimes because of the lie that we have been fed that if it were not for these regimes, uh, then you know, the, the fundamentalists would, would take over. And that's now being proven uh, to be the lie that it always, uh, always was. I think that you know, depending on what happens from here on out, the transition that we see in places like Tunisia and, and Egypt, you're going to be seeing a, a wholly new model of statecraft one that allows for uh, precisely the, the kind of uh, democratic pluralist values that you know, we want to see uh, be fostered uh, in that region of the world, and yet also provides room for uh, religious expression, even conservative religious expression, um, as part of the multiplicity of voices that will ultimately define uh, the future of these, of these countries. And if that's successful, then I think that truly will be the model uh, for statecraft uh, in, in the Middle East for the future. Now, part of that success is going to rely heavily on how North America and Europe deals with these new emerging countries and the way that we reframe our relationship, uh, especially with countries like Egypt. Um, now, with regard to 
the influence that it will have, it depends. Uh, you know, I'm not. I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. I'm, I'm very positive about you know the, the hope for change in the region, just not in Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, for a whole host of reasons, I mean, does not have uh, the 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 necessary formula for the kind of revolutionary changes that we've seen uh, in places like Tunisia, uh, in Libya, in in uh, in Egypt, and and so on. Um, so I don't hold your breath for Saudi. Not, not, that's not, nothing's going to happen in Saudi. But there are other places um, in the region that I think we, we should keep our eyes on. Oman, Syria, certainly. Um, you know, I'm still looking at Algeria. Things have kind of settled a little bit in Algeria, but I do feel that the more successful the Egyptian model becomes, the more the Algerian uh, regime will, be, uh, will face even greater pressure. Uh, to to cave in to to the demands for uh, greater freedoms and, and and greater rights and and, and uh, privileges by the the people, so I think the dominoes are going to start falling. Iran, of course, is its own world. Uh, in many ways, what we're seeing now uh, started in Iran. Uh, I, I say that not just because I'm Iranian and uh, Iranians think that everything starts in Iran, uh, uh, but but because it, it's a it's a it's a very important thing to recognize that the paradigm that was set by the Green Movement in 2009, whereby social media technologies were used to break the monopoly over communication that these authoritarian regimes have, uh, that is the paradigm that was picked up in Tunisia and Egypt. The day that Mubarak left, there was this wonderful moment in which a group of Egyptian uh, students unfurled a banner in Tahrir Square that said, thank you, Iran. And, and really encouraged the Iranians now to, to, to take to the streets. Whether what started in Iran in 2009 will ultimately make its way back there remains to be seen. Uh, but I do think that the more successful, Egypt in particular, I mean, that's where I think a lot of our focus should be. The more successful the transition to democracy in Egypt is, and, and there is a, you know, a, a hope for stability and economic stability um, and development, uh, the more you will see the dominoes start to fall. I come from a Gandhian family. My great-grandparents worked with Gandhi in India, and my wife's family worked with Gandhi in South Africa before he came to India. So I was always brought up with Satyagraha. Um, but they're critics of nonviolence. They say Hitler was actually responsible for the collapse of the British Empire through World War II and the liberation of India, not Gandhi. And in the civil rights movement of the United States, they're critics of uh, King's nonviolent movement, who say that it was actually the United States that wanted to brand itself as more egalitarian in the face of uh, a Russian um, counterpart that ultimately ended Jim Crow and segregation in the United States. We saw what I think is a successful example of nonviolence in Egypt, but we've seen other examples throughout the Middle East that weren't as successful. What do you think about the nonviolence component in the Egyptian movement? Talk a little bit also about the theatrical aspects of it, right. and why was this maybe more successful than other nonviolent civil disobedience movements we've seen in the region in the past. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good point to make because nonviolence works only if people give a damn. And people do not care right now that uh, dozens of nonviolent protesters in Bahrain have been massacred by Saudi troops. Nobody cares. And so nonviolence is not working in, in Bahrain. Um, nobody cares that for a decade now, the Palestinians have been using nonviolent techniques um, it, to fight against the uh, encroaching Israeli occupation. Uh, very specifically, you look at what happened in the village of Budrus, uh, where uh, months and months of precisely the Gandhian uh, technique of nonviolence ultimately uh, forced the Israeli government, uh, uh, forced a decision by the Supreme Court uh, uh, in, in Israel to reroute the wall that, was, that Israel is building that would have destroyed Budros as a village. Except that that uh, ruling came down 18 months ago and nothing has changed. The wall is still being built and, and the Israeli government has completely ignored it. So, you know, I would like to sit here and say nonviolence is the path through true political change, but not if nobody cares. And nobody cares about Boudros. Nobody cares about Bahrain. Uh, so you have to have this theatrical element to it, first and foremost, like we saw 
in, in for instance, in, in Egypt. Um, but at the same time, in a globalized world, the, the, there's this level of interconnectedness now that, that did not exist uh, you know, in the days of, of Gandhi and in the independence of the subcontinent. Um, whereas it's, it's very difficult to imagine that people on their own, no matter how theatrical uh, uh, or the, the display of nonviolence is, is, no matter how united they are in their opposition to their governments, that people on their own can actually uh, affect regime change or, or dramatic political revolution. That, that's not the world we live in any longer. Um, there would, Mubarak would not have left Egypt if North America and Europe did not want him to. It's as simple as that. I mean, you know, the, the, until the, the outside world, until the, out, the rest of the world, particularly the, the power holders, can be um, lured into action, uh, you know, in some way, you know, whether if they believe their national uh, interests are, are at stake or whether it's just what you have in Egypt where you just simply cannot ignore uh, the demands of the people any longer. Um, it's hard to imagine that kind of change. So, you know, nonviolence, I think, is, a, is an important tactic. It's one that's been used by Muslims for a very, very long time. It's not something new, this idea that there's this new tactic all of a sudden that's taking place in the Muslim world. For the first time, they're trying, you know, the nonviolent uh, method. That's simply, that's ridiculous. I mean, uh, going all the way back to, you know, the independence of Algiers. But I do think that nonviolence only works when it, when it can be fused with the national interests of uh, the European states and of North America. That's just sort of the reality of the situation. Last time you were here, you were, we were talking about your book, Beyond Fundamentalisms. And we, at the time, were talking about the public Islamophobia in Europe, the banning of the minarets and the niqabs. Um, and we talked about how, well, at least it won't happen in the United yeah. States. <laughs> Boy, that was a. <laughs> <laughs> that was only a year ago. Since that time, um, Islam, uh, the United States has become more like Europe in its public Islamophobia. Very much. And for many Americans, hating Islam has become patriotic. That's right. Um, this year alone, of course, we've seen the Park 51 controversy, the politicization of Sharia law, the opposition to mosques nationwide, the most recent King hearings on um, Muslim, so called Muslim radicalization. Uh, these issues are constitutional in nature. They implicate civil rights, religious freedom, they implicate equal protection. So what does this tell us about secularism and democracy and constitutional law in the United States? And how do these issues play out uh, in terms of, uh, play out diplomatically uh, to the larger world? Well, it's, it's, it's important that you started this conversation by talking about Europe. Um, my, my dissertation was on, uh, you know, uh, Islam in, in Europe. And one of the things that, and I wasn't the only one who said this, uh, you know, many, many scholars before me uh, and, and, you know, experts on radicalization have said this before, is that the problem with Europe is that uh, because of uh, the European Union and the, and the destruction of these national uh, borders, um, there is an identity crisis in places like France and Germany and, and the Netherlands and, and, you know, Britain, et cetera. Um, and that identity crisis has resulted in a, in a resurgence of ultranationalism. And the problem with uh, that kind of resurgence is that it requires a negative pole. It requires someone to identify yourself against. And that's an old story in Europe. I mean, the, the, you know, what we now know as these modern nation states and the very national identities uh, that were formed were formed quite specifically and consciously in opposition to Jews. I mean, for, for, uh, for many, many people, what it meant to be British or French um, or Dutch or Danish or, or German at a time in which these identities were just starting to become concretized was it meant you weren't a Jew. That's what it meant. And we saw the results of that. And what we're seeing now over the last three, four decades is that while with this new resurgence of nationalism uh, in these countries, the new polar opposite, thanks to immigration, et cetera, uh, is Islam. So for many, many Europeans, what it means to be British is to not be Muslim. Uh, so the BNP, the British National Party, has a very you know, uh, uh, creative political platform in which their entire point is that we're not against immigration, we're against Muslim immigration. 
Uh, we're not against boycotting foreigners. We're against boycotting Muslim-owned businesses. And in fact, in 2006, I was there and uh, doing some field work, and the BNP had issued all these flyers about how to boycott Muslim-owned businesses. And what was, what was fantastic about these flyers is that they were very specific in how to tell that someone is Muslim. So they, were, they showed Sikhs, and they said, not these guys. <laughs> so if it's a turban and a beard, it's OK. You know, not Hindus. They very specifically were saying, not anyone, just Muslims. Um, and part of why experts like myself constantly said that will never happen in America is not just because you know this is a country of immigrants and religious freedoms and all those things that we'd like to think, but because this, it's hard to imagine that Americans would have that same identity crisis that Europeans have. I mean, you know, you may ask a room full of people what it means to be American. You'll you'll get you know 20 different answers, but everyone will have an answer to that question. The fundamental fact that we have to recognize as Americans is that over the last three or four years. A, a great many of our fellow citizens have woken up to a country that they don't recognize anymore. This is not the America that we thought it was. We are not the global superpower that we thought we were. We are certainly not the economic power that we, that we thought we were. We still have the military might, but if anything that we've learned over this last decade is the limits that that military might um, has. And just look at the way we went into Iraq 10 years ago and the way we're going into Libya now. You know, we are just following a group of people into Libya. We are by no means in charge. Uh, and and while, while, OK, the truth is we are in charge. I mean, we are, we are launching all the missiles. But the perception, the perception is that we're just following everybody else. Whereas, you know, I, I, 10 years ago, the perception was quite deliberate that this is, we're in charge here. Um, so, all of those things have changed. And, and you just look, someone mentioned the Tea Party earlier this morning. Just look at the chant of the Tea Party. We want America back. We want our country back. There is an identity crisis in this country about what we truly are, who we are, what it means to be American, that we haven't faced in a generation, if not more. And it just so happens that that negative pole that is always necessary in times of crisis, in times of identity crisis, uh, is, the, is Islam, is Muslims. There's a reason why anti-Muslim sentiment in America in 2011 is far, far higher than it was even in 2001, even in the immediate aftermath. Double digits higher levels of anti-Muslim sentiment 10 years after 9-11 than in the immediate aftermath of after 9-11. Uh, and that's because it's not just about Islam. It's not just about terrorism. It's about the financial collapse. It's about the changing political landscape. It's about the changing racial landscape of this country. Um, and it's about the identity crisis that a lot of uh, Americans are, are facing. For a large swath of Americans, what it means to be American is to not be Muslim. That's what it means. And so when you see this rhetoric uh, that you saw, you know, for instance, with the Park 51 controversy, right? They attacked us on 9-11, and now they want to build a mosque. Very clear what is being said there. When you saw what happened you know, in Southern California here, where you know, children are on their way into a mosque, and they're being pelted with the most despicable hatred by people who are waving American flags and telling them to go home, go home, when in fact home is San Diego. You know, um, That's what I'm talking about here. So it, it's, it's more than just fear of Islam that, 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 that doesn't explain it. It's that Islam has become otherized. Islam has become the receptacle into which all of the fears and anxieties about all of the, the changes that are taking place in this country is being tossed. That's what happened in Europe. And that's what's happening now in America. When President Obama was elected, you know, we, there was a, a lot of um, fanfare. And we all thought he would be a great ambassador to the Muslim world. He would be a great public diplomat. Um, of course, he grew up in a Muslim country. His middle name is Hussein. He opposed the Iraq War. He, his first interview was with Al Arabiya. He uh, stopped using the moniker War on Terror. He gave a courageous speech in Cairo. 
But since then, he's doubled down on Afghanistan. He's drone bombed Pakistan. We're in Libya now. Uh, Guantanamo Bay is still open. Oh, for and business. and and he has uh, uh, presided over the collapse the final collapse of the two-state solution, the end of the peace process, will be laid on Obama's lap. So that being said, you know, what grade do you give him in terms of a public diplomat uh, outreaching to the Muslim world? Has he been successful? What are the perceptions of him? No, no, I think he's been, he's been uh, quite miserable. It's been, it's been a, a, a real, real lack of success. Um, however, and, and I think part of it has to do with the foreign policy. I mean, look, the... The, the tenor is there, um, you know, the, the world view is there, um, the rhetoric is there. And all of those things, I think, are appreciated by Muslims around the world. Uh, but they have to be followed by very concrete steps um, in foreign policy. And the foreign policy of the Obama administration is a continuation of the foreign policy of the Bush administration. And, and as I say, and, I, and I'm not a, you know, exaggerating when I say this, I say this with full consciousness about what I say, uh, it, chief amongst those foreign policy failures has been the absolutely catastrophic handling of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the worst president in history uh, to deal with this conflict. Uh, and, 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 and that's what is going to be his legacy if he doesn't figure out a way uh, to, 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 to turn that around. So insofar as actions, uh, no. I mean, there's been nothing. Now, let me just add a caveat to this, which is that he has been handed a gift on a silver platter right now. The United States had absolutely nothing to do with the, the revolutions that are taking place across the, the Middle East and, and North Africa. In fact, they were on the wrong end of it. They were, yeah, yeah they were, exactly, they were for, for quite some, and still, still have not figured out how to, how to be on the right end exactly. Certainly not when it comes to what's going on in Bahrain. I mean, it's, a, it's an appalling, appalling lack uh, of, of, uh, uh, of concern about you know, the massacre in, in, in Bahrain. Um, I think that he has an opportunity now to do what he said he was going to do and did not do which was to uh, reshape relations between uh, the United States and, and the Muslim world, whatever that means. Um, that has now been handed to him. The, the young people in the region did it for him. And now how we respond, um, how quickly we change our foreign policy um, concerns and priorities into that region, how quickly we begin funneling you know, the money that we send over there away from the military and towards civil infrastructure, that is going to give him an opportunity to actually do what he said he was going to do. So, so it's, he has a chance. He's been, he's been handed this gift. And, and I, for one, hope that you know, he does not allow this opportunity uh, to pass him by the way he did uh, with the Middle East peace process. Uh, one short question, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, you and I are both purveyors and consumers of popular culture. And I think we're both advocates of the role that popular culture has as a form of public diplomacy cultural diplomacy. But there are a lot of critics who say there aren't the metrics necessary to kind of measure its efficacy. Um, where does popular culture and religion intersect in terms of public diplomacy? And what examples have you seen that have encouraged you or that you would term or deem successful? And I say this as to him as someone who uh, has started a, a media consulting company, in, uh, BoomGen, someone who just wrote a book or edited a book called Tablet and the Pen, which showcases popular writing from the Middle East, um, and someone who is a daily contributor to the Daily Beast, so, or a regular contributor to the Daily Beast. So as someone who's on the sort of forefront yeah. of <coughs> this popular culture consciousness as a form of diplomacy. Well, look, on a larger sense, I mean, religion and politics have both failed as, you know, fields of, of um, whether it's international or intercommunal uh, cooperation and relationships. I mean, you know, I immediately when you bring in these fields, uh, you are creating uh, walls, you're creating identities, whereas art and literature, music, television, film, these things are borderless because they are dealing with um, uh, issues that, that reach uh, the, the sort of the level of, of the human rather than uh, dealing with these, you know, sort of abstract symbols and, and, and identities. Um, you know, a perfect, I was talking about Israel-Palestine, here's a great example of this, is that you know, uh, 
It's funny because I, I you know, my, 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 the first time that I went to, to Israel, many, many, many years ago, I was sitting down with an Israeli friend and, and like an ignorant American, you know, I said, you know, if, if, you got, if the Israelis and Palestinians could just sort of get to know each other, you know, if they could just get to know each other, then everything would be fine. And my friend said, see, this is what you Americans don't understand, is that we know each other very, very well. That's why we hate each other, <laughs> because we know each other so well. And while he's right about that on one sense, how they know each other is as labels. They know each other as different nationalities, as different ethnicities, as different you know, religious groups. And yet, they read each other's books, they listen to each other's music. The most popular hip hop act in Israel is a Palestinian act. The most, you know, most watched film in the Palestinian territories is an Israeli movie. Um, and that's because pop culture, however you want to refer to it, art, literature, these things uh, have a natural ability to break down walls, break down barriers, um, it, especially now when, with this new generation, this generation that, that, that you know, really uh, exists so much you know, online and in these social media spaces. The, the fact of the matter is, is that you know, a 19-year-old uh, kid in, in uh, Jakarta uh, has a lot more in common with uh, a 19 year old Muslim kid in Jakarta will have a lot more in common with say a 19 year old uh, Christian kid in Los Angeles than either of them have in common with their own communities because they have this this community this virtual umma you know online that allows them to share in these post materialist concerns um, that have a far greater effect on creating precisely the kinds of um, intercultural bonds that we would like to foster than you know uh, what we've been doing so far. You know, getting usually the problem with you know getting uh, interfaith uh, groups together uh, is that either a you're preaching to the choir. You know, a, a group of Muslim Jews and Christians who meet every Friday don't really need uh, all that much you know from each other. They're already you know uh, in, a, in a place where their their minds are open. Uh, otherwise. Uh, when they get together, it's usually for uh, what I consider to be negative uh, events. We talked about this, I think, last time we talked. That the first time, uh, in certainly my memory, I think any anyone's memory that I can think of, in which the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the chief rabbi uh, uh, in Israel, and the the head of the Orthodox Church, got together. The very first time they got together, it was three it was three years ago. Um, to issue a, 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 a declaration of common concern. It wasn't to promote peace. It wasn't you know, to promote understanding or whatever. It was to, uh, so all three of them could come together and condemn gays all together as one. You know, it's the thing we have in common. We all hate the gay people. Uh, that's unfortunately you know, more often the case when you have you know, these sort of relations based on fields of you know, religion or politics, whereas art and culture, that doesn't happen. Well, uh, it's my job. To, Reza's uh, extremely busy, and we have, to ha we have a hard cut at 2.30, so we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Do we have a microphone that's going around? No. OK, so I just ask that you stand up and articulate your question loudly so we can pick it up on video. And we'll start with Stephen. Um. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. I have uh, a brief point in response to what you said already and then a question. Um, <clears throat> a point uh, in describing the rise in anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, I mean, you, we've talked, you, I've heard you both talk about uh, the kind of crisis we're facing. And I didn't really, uh, this is un not, it's gone underneath the radar for a lot of us. Um, but I, I mean, one of the things that I've done in, in my research, I've, I've uh, followed up on the, on the whole thesis about civil religion. and. Um, it's uh, seemed to me uh, obvious the last few years that uh, the president has traditionally been the high priest of the American civil religion, and what we have with Obama is an attempt to undercut his authority and to you know refuse to recognize him in this role. The ceremonies he performs are not valid, and so you scratch the surface of the anti-Obama movement and you know the birther controversy mm -hmm. over the supposed forging of his birth certificate, which of course has been proven to be false, which won't stop these people from believing that. But if you go look at the birther sites, just one of those scratch of the surface at the links that they uh, the, to those sites, you find it's all about he's really a Muslim. That's right. And so I mean, there you have a really interesting case where we have a legitimation crisis, but it's, that legitimation crisis is linked very closely with anti-Muslim prejudice. 
So that's mm -hmm. uh, one just my point there. But then the, the, I loved your comparison of uh, today's uh, the internet and social media uh, having the same role in the Muslim world as the Reformation, as the Pentecost did in, in the Reformation. And I've written about that myself in some of my uh, my work. Um, uh, it seems to me that, that um, one of the things that we're, uh, uh, it might be an interesting point of comparison, which I just asked you to respond to. Uh, well, firstly, the secularization thesis that we all, I mean, we, I've heard people say today, well, the secularization thesis has been disproved. I would think, I would want to complicate that a little bit and say, so, uh, the uh, rise in religiosity is itself a response to the rise of secularism. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to fal try to falsify the secularization mm -hmm. thesis. Modernity is uh, about in a way, about uh, forming a secular identity for nation states. But at the same time, that creates a hostility and a counter-reaction. So I mean, these can both be true. Um, but um, 1,400 years after uh, Jesus uh, was here uh, teaching, uh, you know, considered the lilies of the field and uh, blessing of peacemakers, um, Western Europe was beginning, uh, you know, Ejecting the, the Muslims and the Jews from Spain and uh, beginning a long era of witch, of witch And so, the height of uh, and the religious wars that followed the Catholic and Protestants. So, you could say, uh, you know, 1,500 years after Jesus, we were uh, in, in, inflamed by uh, prejudices and passions and the desire to kill uh, those who disagreed with us. Now, 1,400 years after the Prophet Muhammad, we're seeing, uh, you know, some uh, sentiment of this sort in the Muslim world. Uh, the Reformation did not only uh, bring about secularism and tolerance. And a, I mean, the tolerance that, that came uh, in the wake of the Reformation came, only came after a bitter and bloody battles were fought. Uh, well, the first point, I think, uh, about Obama is a very important one, yes. I mean, according to Newsweek, 25%, one out of every four Americans believes that Obama is a Muslim. And while that is a crazy statistic, what's really profoundly disturbing about it is that it's almost a 12% jump from when he was elected. So more people now think that he's a Muslim than they did when he was first elected. The Pew, the Pew Foundation people began to sort of crunch these numbers. And what they discovered was that the more you disagree with Obama's domestic agenda, the more likely you are to believe he's a Muslim. 47% of registered Republicans think that Obama is a Muslim. Among self-identified Tea Partiers, it is almost 60%. And that's what I mean when I say Islam has become a receptacle. If you disagree with Obama's health care plan, you probably think he's a Muslim. If you disagree with his financial regulation plan, you probably think he's a Muslim. Um, that is what we're talking about when we say that all that is deemed as not American is being labeled now as Muslim. And Obama is the perfect example of this. With regard to sort of this issue of you know specific steps. I mean, I think I think you really have the you know the the the, the spark for this reformation process is colonialism um, and the confrontation uh, with uh, uh, Europe and the way that that resulted in obviously very negative things, the raping and pillaging, uh, but also in higher levels of education and literacy. The and. More specifically, the translation of the Quran. I mean, you cannot have the Christian Reformation until you have a German New Testament. It's as simple as that. And you can't say sola scriptura if no one can read the scriptura. Uh, so that's that's exactly what's what's been profound over the last 50 years, in which the Quran has been translated into more languages than in the previous 1,400 years combined, uh, because of the theological complexities of, of you know, Arabic uh, and, and the Quran. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, the, the notion is, is that if the Quran is translated into any other language, it's no longer the Quran. It's now just an interpretation of the Quran, which is why when you go to Barnes and Noble and buy it, the Quran in English, the Arabic is there. The Arabic is there not for you to read it. If the Arabic weren't there, it's not the Quran. It can't be called the Quran. Now, obviously you can imagine the effect that this would have on the 95% of the world's Muslims for whom Arabic is not, you know, a primary 90% of the world's Muslims who, for whom Arabic is not, you know, a, a primary language. Um, so that translation, access, uh, education, 
you know, these are the things that are necessary to start to foster this sense of individualism that then really, you know, gives gives rise to the Reformation process. We're really tight, tight on time. I'm going to ask everyone to limit to brief questions, and we'll go to the gentleman in the back. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, how can you actually believe that Marx has this open door, you know, transparent uh, influence in society when you look at the Sistine Chapel? The final judgment, the icon. Right. You're going to hell, you're not. Right. Art has always been very provocative. Put up uh, Black Sabbath, okay, <laughs> against mm, any any religious pop music that's going out there today. Culture war, all the time. I think you're a little bit, you know, hedging on the fact that art is also divisive as well as open. Well, let me put it this way. So. Maroon was talking about Gandhi, right? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I always, I always like to say exactly where I get my percentages from because people throw out percentages all the time. But I can't remember actually where I read this. Uh, I believe, anyway, I can't remember exactly where I read this. But before the movie Gandhi came out, about 18%, percent of Americans knew who Gandhi was. 18%. You can now go onto the street and grab any person off the street and ask them about Gandhi. They'll tell you who Gandhi was and what Gandhi stood for. Not because they saw it on Fox or you know, NBC, not because they read a book about it, not because they went to college, but because that movie put that man in the narrative, in the, in the sort of modern narrative of, of the, the United States. Um, that's what I mean by the power of art. It, it can transcend, for good and for bad, by the way. I mean, you know, I don't, by any means, am I, am I uh, giving a value judgment on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that art has the means to transcend the sort of borders and boundaries that separate individuals uh, into distinct communities because ultimately what it has to do with is more about the human condition. Uh, you know, you look at the, the uh, Varun mentioned tablet and pen. So much of the Arab writings in there, particularly the stuff that was written in the 60s and the 70s, is uh, you know, so, I mean, you want to talk about you know, speaking truth to power. Uh, great Syrian poet, Zakaria Tamar, uh, who writes this entire uh, poem uh, called The Enemies, about the way in which the 67 war with Israel was uh, reframed by Syrian media, Syrian newspapers, Syrian political and religious leaders as a victory, a great victory for the Arab world. Uh, and the only people who had the ability to write against that and to talk about the truth were not the journalists, were not the democracy activists, uh, were not the, you know, the people in the pulpit, it was the poets. The poets were the ones who were able to say through symbols, through metaphors, the reality of you know the social situation that's going on here, and as such, we're able to I think transcend precisely these kinds of borders that I was talking about, in a way that you know religious and political leaders just simply do not have, and that, that's what I mean. You know, uh, Black Sabbath is you know as popular in you know Egypt uh, as it is in you know Los Angeles, uh, and and that I think. Indicates that there is a power, that there is there is some there is some potency uh, to art, literature, pop culture um, that can be used for good, but can also be used for bad. Certainly. Yes, we'll have the young lady here. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Uh, what? How does the story of the Sistine Chapel relate to the story of the Sistine Yeah, well, I mean, uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. The question was about the, the status of women in the democratization um, processes that we've seen around these countries. I mean, look, the reality is we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, the, the, the relations between men and women uh, in places like Tunisia and Algeria and Egypt and Iran are vastly different. Uh, you know, when we saw the revolution in 2009, the women were at the forefront in, in Iran. Uh, when we saw, you know, the, in Tunisia, it was hard to see where the women were. Um, and certainly in a place like Libya, 
you know, you don't see women at all out onto the streets. So I, I think, you know, we don't know yet. We just don't know. What I will say, however, is that the same phenomenon that I've been talking about, the rapid individualization of Islam, uh, which has transformed the political, religious, and social uh, cultures uh, of Muslim-majority states, uh, is also having a profound effect on women. I mean, you have now uh, women who are going to the Quran for themselves, without any mediator, defining for themselves what, what the, the scripture means, uh, without you know, re relying on uh, you know, 14 centuries of male-dominated uh, you know, interpretation by the ulama. Um, you have women imams now in places like in China, in, in, in uh, Indonesia, in Toronto. Um, not so much in the Arab world yet, but you know, I think it's a, it's a good global process. So, um, you know, there's there's reason for concern, I think, but there's some reason for for optimism too, precisely because the the generation that seems at least to be at the forefront of these radical political and social changes, um, they are not as burdened by the strict division between men and women that we saw in their parents' generation. Uh, partly, again, this has to do with the way that they have consumed pop culture. Um, they don't come from the same world that their parents did, where the separation of men and women was so complete. Uh, their world is one in which men and women live together on television, on film, in music, on the internet. Um, and it's very much more understood as part of societal structure, I think, than, than their parents. But again, I'm being cautious here. We'll, we'll, we'll really have to wait and see. We have time for one more very short question. Um, thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of points. You Could you speak up, please? I just have a couple of points that uh, you mentioned about uh, Islam being more of identity rather than faith. All religions, All not religions. just Islam. Every religion in the world. I'm about Islam as per se at the moment. Don't you think that there is a bit of faith as well in the sense that Muslim communities in Muslim world, for example, let's take my country, Pakistan, mm -hmm. there is a clash at the moment between the different faiths that, it, uh, that take over Islam, spiritual and Sufi Islam versus the Wahhabi Islam. So there is a debate and a dialogue in that. I think the identity part comes in when you are talking about Muslim and non-Muslim communities, but within the Muslim communities, there is a great deal of dialogue about faith and which is the right faith and which is the right way to go about it. Secondly, when you said about the uh, movements that are taking place in North Africa and, and at the Arab countries, and you said Saudi Arabia, nothing's going to happen much. But do you really feel that these movements can be sustained if Saudi Arabia, if there's no change in Saudi Arabia? Because let's look at it this way. Saudi Arabia is one country where Muslims, I mean, see it as a rallying point and they actually go there with, well, with the oil, money, and everything, but because there's such there's Makkah and Medina. So unless there is an actual change in Saudi Arabia, how sustainable do you think the changes in the rest of the Muslim countries would be? Thank you, that's a very good point. I actually disagree. Uh, no, I think, I think that the vast majority of Muslims, particularly those in the Middle East, have nothing good to say about Saudi Arabia at all. And they completely and utterly separate the wardens of the sanctuary in Mecca and, and Medina from the uh, despotic, gluttonous regime uh, that runs that, that country, which I, I dare not even call really a country. It's really the, the, it's a multinational corporation that's the sole proprietary ownership of a particular clan. Uh, you know, you can't say that there are these you know, citizens who actually you know, have something to say with, uh, with regard to what, what the country does. Um, so no, on the contrary, I think Saudi Arabia is utterly relevant. Uh, it's, a, it's a symbol of the past that these young people want nothing to do and with and, and it really I really do see a separation between the the places of worship the Saudis as wardens and the Saudis as a regime I said specifically in the Middle East because one of the weird phenomena that most of you who have traveled you know in Muslim majority countries know is that for some reason the further you get from Saudi Arabia the better the impression of Saudi Arabia is uh, but you know, as you get closer and closer, you know, I mean, if you've ever heard an Egyptian person say something positive about the Saudis, let me know because I've never seen it. Um, 
The first part of your uh, uh, question, uh, which I think is, is really an important one because it, it gives me an opportunity to, to emphasize uh, what I mean here. Religion, I'm not saying that religion has nothing to do with faith. I'm saying that it is more a matter of identity than a matter of beliefs and practices. And this is true across the board. In the United States, polls show that 70% of Americans self-identify as Christian. Now, think about that for a moment. So, yeah, do you really think 7 out of 10 Americans go to church on Sundays? Or 7 out of 10 Americans you know, follow the teachings of Jesus or read the Bible? Do you think 7 out of 10 Americans could tell you anything about Jesus other than he was born in a manger and died on a cross? Of course not. The statement, I am a Christian, is a statement of identity. It encompasses your worldview. It encompasses your economic policy, your political viewpoint, your, your, the way that you see the world around you. And so it's the same thing across the world. You know, the, the, so is the statement, I am a Hindu, I am a Buddhist, I am a Muslim. Uh, and even w with, within sort of intra-religious uh, 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 tensions, um, the difference between a Sufi and a Wahhabi is a matter of identity, is a matter of how they see the world around them. It's not just about beliefs. It's not just about differences in, in practices. Um, it, it, in, it encompasses all of those things, but it is very much a part of the multiplicity of markers that define individuals in, in a modern world. Um, so we have to always remember this. We cannot, um, again, I go back, I mean, I think John said it better than I could say it. We have to stop this dichotomy that we think exists between religion and secularism. You know, it's, it, we, we say, and then, well, that, that doesn't exist in the Middle East. It doesn't exist anywhere. You know, the, these are, these are uh, separations that are a, a part of how you see the world around you. Uh, you can be quite faithful and still secularist. Uh, and, you know, it, so it, we, we have to kind of stop thinking in those simple divisions and recognize that religion is just one of the multiple identities, you know, ethnicity, nationality, citizenship, gender, sexual orientation, religion is a, a part of that overall, uh, uh, you know, st structure that defines uh, individuals in the modern world. Well, please join me, everyone, in thanking you. Thank you.